Uh, it's with great pleasure that I welcome so many of you from across Canada and elsewhere to this newest installment of the All Art series, the AI Conversation. Uh, as I think we are all aware, AI is currently a really big thing to hear about, to read about, to play with, to think about, and to talk about. And it all falls into the good, the bad, and the ugly, as well as the nuanced and the unknown. Tonight's conversation will be filtered through the lens of the art department. And though there are many meandering, expansive, and connective threads that uh, extend well beyond that frame, we will not land on a definitive idea, a firm policy, or even a clear position, but rather the intention of tonight's conversation is to invite a range of considerations and prompt further questions about the relationship between our creativity and AI. This is at its heart, a conversation about our creative process and the myriad influences, evolutions, possibilities, and impacts that AI might bring to these processes and the outcomes. Our panel tonight is comprised of individuals who represent a range of talent, skills, and expertise. And I look forward to introducing you to them in just a few minutes. But first, there are a few things to mention. To allow the hour-long conversation to flow with ease, uh, we'll reserve the questions and the uh, answers and comments for the end. But if you have something to ask or a comment to make, please put it into the question answer um, column uh, anytime you it prompts you. And uh, we'll be wrapping up probably in about an hour for, to address the questions, et cetera. In the meantime, in the chat, please let us know where you're zooming in from and feel free to chat amongst each other. The event is being recorded and the recording will be posted on the DGC YouTube channel uh, in a few days. Our tech guru, Julian Lung, who's working in the back room here with us, will post the link to this channel in the chat for those of you that are interested. Now, before introducing you to our panel, please join me in honoring this request and acknowledgement. Wherever you are in Canada or elsewhere in the world, please take a moment to honor our Indigenous people's long history of welcoming many nations to their beautiful territory. I'm grateful for all that we have and I'm committed to upholding and uplifting the voices and values of our host nation. Now I'd like to introduce you to tonight's panel. Please welcome Nicola Rose. Hello, Nicola. Nicola, Hello is a, there. Yeah. Nicola is a graphic designer and art director who has worked in the Toronto film industry since 2014. While primarily working in print graphics, over the course of her career, Nicola has taken on a wide breadth of roles within the art department, building knowledgeable experience as coordinator in clearances and also in motion graphics, contributing to diverse and award-winning projects such as IT, Len and Company, The Umbrella Academy, and Star Trek Discovery. Nicola has a true love for world, build, world building and delivering finely crafted detail and is a longtime fan of the creative arts from film to video games. She's always enthusiastic to share her passions and talking about AI is one of them. Hello now, Therese York. Hi, Reese. Based in Toronto, Reese York is a creative director and writer in the video game industry and is a concept artist in, direct, in the Directors Guild of Canada having contributed to Star Trek Strange New Worlds, Beacon 23, and The Expanse to name just a few. With an impressive career spanning comics, video games, animation, television, film, and role-playing games, Reese has contributed to notable comic book titles such as Deadpool, Thundercats, G.I. Joe, Battle of the Planets, and Robotech. And his creative vision was instrumental as the series production designer for Blues, Clues, and You. Reese serves as the Director of Technology on the Board of Directors for the Toronto Animation Arts Festival International and was formerly a Senior Software Engineer at Autodesk. Passionate about innovative storytelling, Reese continues to push the boundaries of creativity and technology. Our third panelist is Tristan Tondino. Bonjour, Tristan. Um, Hello, everybody. Tristan is truly a multidisciplinarian. Tristan is a Montreal-based art director, scenic artist, visual artist, as well as a PhD candidate in philosophy and linguistics at McGill University. As a DGC art director, he recently completed The Last of Us season one. And as a painter, Tristan chose a professional and one man and group ex gallery exhibitions. He is co-president of the film company, Lady Liberty Pictures Incorporated, and is the co-author and illustrator of the children's book series, Soso and Frida. And finally, please meet our moderator for tonight's conversation, Sam Bischoff. 
Bonjour, Sam. Sam is the manager of policy and regulatory affairs at the DGC. Based in Montreal, he's a key member of the national DGC staff where he oversees all policy and regulatory matters within the organization. In this role, Sam's work was central to the successful adoption of the online streaming act, otherwise built C11, that has now been implement, implemented by the CRTC. So thanks for that work, Sam, very important. Sam's educational background includes fine arts, film history, and media law in France. And in Canada, Sam has garnered valuable experience working in the film, television, and digital media sectors, holding various positions across the country. He is particularly passionate about the evolution of public policy, monetization challenges, and the preservation of creators' status. And I'll add that Sam is also a visual artist with an active and impressive professional painting and exhibition practice. Thanks to all of you for joining this conversation tonight. And because I know there's a lot to talk about, please take it away, Sam. Thank you, Marianne, and good afternoon. Good, every, good evening, everyone, depending on where you're located in the country. So as Marianne stated earlier, we're in a gray zone right now with AI, full of nuances um, and unanswered questions. So let's have a look at the good, the bad, and in some cases, the ugly of AI. Uh, be before we talk about the creative process and consideration on how AI impacts the AI departments, I'd like to state a few facts. Today, the Directors Guild of America and the US Studios, the AMPTP, announced a tentative agreement confirming that AI is not a person and that generative AI cannot replace the duties performed by members. It is great to have this confirmation that human creation matters, but what about the use of AI tools? Tech company NVIDIA, who supplies computer hardware and software known for its graphic cards, has seen its valuation surge at 1 billion over the expectations of AI generated videos. On May 30th, in a surprising, su surprising move, Japan governments reaffirmed that it will not enforce copyrights on data used in AI training. And with the uncertainty surrounding the, the future of work and the rise of AI, it was commonly believed that creative professionals would remain immune to automation and disruption. However, we know that the advance of widespread generative AI has challenged this assumption, causing considerable ambiguity regarding the future prospects of writers, directors, art designers, and other occupations. Each day, new possibilities arise, making it increasingly difficult to strike a balance between the opportunities and threats posed by AI in the creative industries. According to recent research, generative AI has the potential to automate approximately 26% of tasks in sectors such as art, design, entertainment, media, and sports. But also, we should not assume that everyone is currently using AI on all productions. And how, how much do we want to use it? And as we know, also some studios forbid the use of AI tools. Um, I will remind that again, the conversation today is not about policy or collective bargaining but about how this new technology will affect our creative work. So let's dive right in. Um, and so for starters, we'll um, begin with a roundtable discussion with some visual ex examples of uh, AI uh, generative concept art and um, other images uh, about what it means for our directors. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with AI tools, they are quickly becoming ubiquitous. Uh, some of the used tools are the most famous one are Midjourney, Stable Diffusion, DALL-E for what we would call from text to image. Um, and even Photoshop is now offer offering certain AI functions. Um, so we'll start with you, Nicola, and, um, and we'll uh, pull some images uh, on the screen so you can comment on them. Uh, we know that generative AI trains on art without the artist's consent. There are no ethical guardrail right now. And I know that you have some images uh, that, that speak about this. Yeah, I'd love to talk about this. It's definitely um, where I think a few of my roles that I've taken on intersect via, you know, like artwork, what's permissible on screen, clearances. So I think it's a huge part of the conversation. Um, the the ethical side of it. it when the machine learning is only as strong as the data that it's being fed, um, you know, I think a lot of the fears come from 
you know, money-based industry fears, but I can, I can, you know, we'll, we'll go over this first. So these are images that I wanted to share. I feel that they are particularly like pertinent to the conversation um, and are like a fantastic example of, you know, a real world artist, like well-known artist that is uh, struggling at, as a result of all of this. Um, so this is showing that Greg Rutowski, sorry if I'm not saying his name right, <laughs> um, uh, his name is one of the most commonly searched prompts and is the real fear that comes with that is that prompt artwork is now like starting to surpass even some of his own imagery in searches or even if it isn't right now the fear could be that that's where it's going to trend in the future and the ethical considerations come down to um whether the software is opt-in or opt-out are artists being included at the table for the development of this software. Um, it's a huge part of it. And and I, I loved this sticky note image. Um, it's from one of the threads that I posted on the Facebook page. And I think it shows the huge difference between human inspiration and machine learning and like how it puts out a product based on like the data that's put into it um which is that it can't produce something that it that it, it cannot produce something that it hasn't been trained on and it's a it's a huge part of the conversation for again like are the artists you know whose work is so heavily influencing some of like the the most used prompts right now are they being compensated how will this affect them in the future um i think many people in the arts i love that you mentioned that it felt like you know a field that would possibly be untouchable and i think that a big thing that we're all feeling right now is you know why why is it being pointed at the arts before other fields like perhaps um and it's this nuanced conversation that i'm really happy that we're having great thank you um yeah and 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 Reese, um, I think you, there are a few images that uh, we you shared with us, um, uh, two sets actually, um, and and this time we're looking at I believe um, AI generated images created with uh, Mid Journey, is is that correct? Reese. We might be having a little tech issue here. Um, so if it doesn't work, oh, no, you're, you're on. It's good. Can you hear me now? Oh, great. Yeah. Um, yeah, so these uh, images are ones that um, have basically just come straight from the prompt. Uh, there's been no alteration or anything like that. So um, you can see they're, they're very compelling. Um, I mean, uh, it it certainly wouldn't be something that um, you know could it's not not an exact thing. Um, there are a lot of different influences here. Uh, I'm not sure the exact prompt that I use to generate these, but um, I mean it could very well serve as a you know an inspiration board or a mood board and that sort of thing. So this is just an example of what Mid Journey is currently capable of, and it's definitely evolved uh, even in the past uh, three or four months as well. Yeah, and I think we have another uh, set of images coming. But what what you what you said also is that you didn't need to to edit or to modify. No. no. Yeah. So the the top one that we see here is is uh, something like a prop design. Uh, it is it is very looks very AI generated. So this this is the sort of thing that um, you know would have to be um, heavily altered uh, by an artist to actually be even useful. Uh, in the art department. Uh, the one below, um, this is just sort of like an illustration in the sort of Italian style. Um, it's, um, you know, it's a, a nice, nice painting for sure. Uh, but you can see that it, it, it knows about composition. Knowing sort of is a, maybe the wrong term, but it can create uh, composition, it can create a good color palette and all of that sort of thing, again, which is based off of um, training. And you'll sort of notice as well too, um, whether that's meant to be a fence or a signature, sometimes those artifacts can pop up right in the middle there um, around that. So it's definitely something that's, it's a bit controversial for sure. 
Thank you. Thank you for the diverse uh, examples. Um, and now, Tristan, you, you've got uh, also a different set of photos. Uh, and, and I think it, it captures um, the, the idea that right now humans are doing you know, the hard job of uh, maybe doing the hard job <laughs> on minimum wage while the robots and AI you know, write, uh, write poetry, paint, um, imagines. Yeah, so it, it, it's sort of, can you hear me OK? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, it's gotten the, this sort of Marxist dream completely backwards, right? We were, you know, uh, I mean, I don't know how many of you <laughs> know what I'm referring to, but Marx was telling us that in the future, uh, once we've passed through capitalism, we'd have this wonderful thing where machines would do all the hard labor and the menial labor and humans would be free to be creative and so on. But it seems to have gotten a little bit backwards. Uh, we're, we seem to be relegated much more toward um, the, the physical work uh, until at least we have robots that can you know, do the kind of jobs. Um, so the, that, that's one of the kind of, I have basically a number of different clusters here. Uh, one is that issue of, of um, uh, it, whether or not it's actually successfully improving our lives uh, economically or not. Uh, it's definitely generating, generating a huge amount of data in our work, I, like way more data than I would like at times. Uh, the second thing, of course, is that uh, th this, um, the images that I chose have something to do with obsolescence. Because I was a scenic artist, uh, you know, in the 80s, uh, and I continued to be a scenic artist for a long time, a lot of what we did completely disappeared, like, uh, like overnight. Um, but for us, it was overnight, you know, it took no time at all for us to stop doing backdrops. Uh, there's a, you know, the uh, the perspective drawing there, I think is Alberti, but uh, that approach to doing perspective is gone. Uh, you know, you, you you build everything in, you know, in, uh, in all the viewports that you get out of your programs now are like, you can get views, it's not hard to do. But th this leads to something that I, uh, oh, and also the all the styrofoam at the bottom, um, uh, you know, we, we can easily uh, have stuff generated uh, direct from computer uh, cut for us and so on. All, all these things are, are sort of advantages that these tools bring us. But it's something I want to get to, aside from the obsolescence, is um, that's the drawing there by Peter Stratford, uh, who's the wonderful art director and set designer. Um, but it, this sort of idea that there's uh, the possibility of niche uh, jobs that remain that AI just can't do, and that will just never be able to do. So that's something I, I think uh, that's always been there. There's still sign painters who, you know, there's just less of it. There's still backdrop painters. There's still, so this idea of niche is, is something too that I'd like to chat a little bit about. Uh, the requirement of permanent education, we're all sort of stuck with having to, you know, learn, sort of be per permanent students. Uh, so those are sort of the main things. Uh, um, the two last images, one is uh, an image of, uh, uh, I think the prompt was uh, show people having fun uh, and then so they put them on a highway with all of their com computers. Anyway, generally speaking, that those are some of the themes that I want to talk about. I also have a whole bunch of themes that come out of uh, my background in philosophy and generative ga grammar, specifically the difference between rationalism and empiricism, but we can chat about that a little bit, you know, as we go. Thank you. Um, and, and maybe, you know, from that question of obsolescence, um, I'll, I'll move, you know, on with my first question, um, uh, which is, you know, what does AI mean to you right now for the art department work? Maybe a more question of like the day to day. And can you explain maybe how it affects, you know, daily tasks uh, or a specific question? You know, is, it, is it possible today to create a mood board only using AI prompts? Is that sufficient? Um, and are there other parts of your work where you can already automatize? Um, you know, you task using AI. I'm assuming we are all jumping in on these questions. But so, yeah, yeah, if there is one of you who wants to start. Uh... <laughs> but yeah, absolutely, sure. I mean, it, it started to happen with mood boards, definitely. Uh, a lot of production designers are using it, definitely, to to show. Well, it's because it's it, it's it's surprising what comes out, right? Nicolas, I, I think you wanted to say something. I no 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 no. I'm I'm all good. I am I'm thinking and taking it all in. And um, yeah, I think I think 
I think that there is, you know, a, a, a huge potential for the tasks that it could be taken care of, that it could be helping with. I think where I keep coming to is that like for me personally, like if we're answering this personally, it's it's harder for me to focus on the tasks where it could be more helpful with, given some of the fears that we have around obsolescence, like you were mentioning, where I would love to just be having a conversation about, you know, like the fun things that it could do. Like, I think when Dolly first came out, you know, I think we were all using it for a week, saying like, you know, Nicolas Cage on bicycle with a capybara and seeing like what would come out. And I know from, you know, research that I've done in like my personal time that this is where I think the conflict arises because the conversation isn't just that. It isn't just what are the cool fun things that this technology can do. It is a much bigger conversation that comes in, yeah, like ethics, you know, economic impact on our society. Like it's a huge conversation. Um, um, but but yeah, I think I think some of the immediate fears are e things like mood boards. You know, I'm certainly thinking of our concept illustrators, like within the guild. And you know, I I haven't taken on the role myself, but um, you know, have become quite close with many of the concept illustrators on my shows. And it you know, it saddens me to think of like their role being like replaced. And I think that the nuance of role is uh, another like really important facet of this conversation. Ari, things like what um, you were stating at the start with the DGA reaching a tentative agreement on the status of like what AI is. Like, my goodness, that's a whole conversation in and of itself. Um, but I definitely think, yeah, like mood boards, things like concept art, I think, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. I think I think that's what I got right now. Okay, and and now maybe in connection, you know, between the, the use of AI on a production, I, I know maybe you want to talk about this, Nicolai. Is that, um, like I said, we don't want to get into you know um, copyright related issues and policy, but concretely, where we stand right now in terms of right clearance and being able to use AI on a production, like what what is your experience and when do you think it's it's going to go? Yeah, and like Reese just saying, you know. Again, we can jump in, jump in whenever you'd like. I know I'm a bit of a bit banter myself. So if I'm talking too long, jump in and, and you know, keep that going. But yeah, so like right now, <clears throat> I think that there is, you know, a, from a print graphics standard, we're very safe at the moment because there's just no way to get a generated image like AI on the screen on the form of a graphic. Like there's there are not licenses in place that would cover this. Um, you know, I I would love, I think it would be great, like if if uh if the DGC continues to have panels like this in the future to elaborate on the conversation, I'd love if we could get like a clearance person in, like, you know, one of the pros themselves. Um, but you know, you'll know that if you've gone, you'll know having gone through the clearance process already you know, how, how many things are in place for like copyright protections and, and, you know, what we have to submit to be able to like use artwork and it's all about liability and who's going to take the liability and risk assessment. And right now for print graphics, the, the, you know, again, the, it, it, the application is not there yet, but that does not mean it's not something that uh, we are, you know, impervious to or that can evolve in the future. Um, one of the things that was mentioned on the Facebook thread, for instance, was uh, stock companies having their own generative AI. And like that is, you know, again, like it, like, it, it was, a, it's in Jurassic Park, right? Where he's like, we, we didn't stop to think if we like, why are you, I'm losing nerd points here because I can't fucking remember the sentence. Sorry for sorry, but you know what I'm getting at. Like, it's the whole like, yeah, we could do this, but given that the technology is moving as fast as it is, I think we need, you know, we need to have an understanding and we need to know how this is going to affect us like in a very broad sense. So even if it's not coming for certain aspects within 
the art department rolls right now does not mean that we're impervious to it. It's, you know, we're going to have to take it in and we're a guild. So we should be talking for all of our people, you know, the, looking out for all of our people. The copyright issues is one of the main reasons why we don't see a lot of uh, mid journey generated concepts and that sort of thing happening as well, at least on some of the, the, uh, tier A shows. I do know that it is being used though in some of the lower tier shows that, um, you know, even if it's just kept internally and that sort of thing. And and that's the thing is like, I know that a lot of, a lot of this approach is very negative and it's not, uh, generally I believe in that the, it's not the artists that we have to worry about, um, you know, improperly using AI uh, art uh, tools. It's, it's more about the producers, uh, the Sorry, I won't say directors, but the just the people who aren't trained artists. Um, uh, that uh, you know is is sort of where the it comes in question. Because again, it's um, the stuff is to to call it AI at the moment is a bit misleading. I feel it's again it's more um, machine learning right now. But um, generally, you know, it, the the computer itself doesn't understand what it creates. So. You know, that's uh, something to keep in mind. Sorry to interrupt, Reese. What you're saying yep. is actually really interesting because it is a kind of intelligence, I think. I mean, without getting into definitions of you yeah. know, what we mean by intelligence, but the troubling part is that it's kind of like an alien intelligence. And I'm, I'm saying that because, first of all, it, it, it doesn't have, it, it doesn't do at all what we do. As, you know, children's, children grow up, they see one dog and they get the concept dog. This thing, it just, it just associates billions of images until it arrives at what you know at the ability to generate billions of stereotypes of dogs well we're not like that and we're also we do have sort of a you know very likely some type of innate moral sense that it doesn't have like at all there's nothing in it but it doesn't understand it's really odd what it doesn't understand if you ask for a planned view of something it can't do it. it. Doesn't know what a plan view is. It's it's very strange. So on the one hand, it has this massive power to get to to data. By the other hand, doesn't understand simple concepts like the difference between an elevation and a plan. So it's very strange. Um, so that's why I'm saying it's kind of like an it's it's not like us at all. And and at the same time, it's spending a lot of energy studying us. <laughs> and that's I think a little creepy. So. Totally agreed. And oh, sorry, Sam. Last, like, last point to add in. Um, uh, um, it, it's the 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 training and like where it is receiving the training from. And again, like the speed of the technology. Um, you know, even the Mid Journey creator himself has said, like, you know, who who knows? Like, a, a lot of the conversations are around the astronomical speed, and are we ready? for the considerations, you know, that, that are going to come with it, um, that again, are, are going to affect and ripple across society. It won't just be creative industries. It's just that right now it's very much, yeah, like a, a, a major issue for us that is, you know, copyright and fair use has been a long, 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 long ongoing discussion. Uh, again, like linking it back to clearances, like it is a clearance lawyer making a risk assessment based on the information that you have pro provided them about the artworks that you're creating. Like there's a reason that concept illustrators don't necessarily have to put their work together with stock images because their work is not necessarily going to be shown on screen. So if they need to grab things from Google, it's not um, a, a clearance issue per se until it goes on screen um, and how that's going to be interpreted, um, you know, it's it's a long road ahead. <laughs> but, but we are at the beginning of it and that's, so who knows where it's going to go. But uh, just to get, relay a little uh, sort of anecdote from last summer, I taught a class and students started using chat GPT uh, and I didn't notice. So they were generating essays for me uh, that had been written by chat GPT. And the interesting thing is, Aside from the, the clearance issue being about with regard to images, it doesn't know how to do a quotation. Like it definitely gives you links, but it doesn't tell you that it's taken a huge chunk of, of, uh, of um, um, uh, sorry, of text right out of something, right? And, and just copied it there. So it's supplying you an essay. Anyway, so I found a whole bunch, I just would take chunks where I could tell. 
I, you can tell because the quotation mark is incorrect. Anyway, so I would dump it on and I go, well, you just, you know, it came directly from Wikipedia, but the student didn't know. So, so it, it, it's, it's surprising that that's a missing concept, that it doesn't, it, not only does it know how to, you know, you know, it's going to pick an image, it's swiping the image completely. It also doesn't seem to be able to know that it's swiping text completely. You need to, you can't, you just can't do that, you know. It's not being given a moral code itself. The moral code lies within the users that are feeding it the data and then what is done with it. The machine doesn't know. It's just being given data and being told, do this. <laughs> but maybe it could know. I mean, that's the whole, you know, wacky future of AI. <laughs> so I, I've got more questions on the, on the you know, how AI is a transformative force and how we change maybe, you know, the creative vision. But I see a question in the chat from Wilfred, uh, Wilfred sorry, Lee, uh, asking how are productions using mood boards for pre-developments and then transforming it for production to avoid any legal issues? So is, is that a possibility that's um, to, to go around the limitations of, um, of copyright issues by, by starting very early in the process? I, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, I know that uh, generally uh, there have, have been um, times when people will come in with uh, AI generated imagery, but depending again on the production, they may or may not have a policy about that. So uh, what I have been doing myself when I'm doing concept is I might generate, it's sort of like, instead of going to like a photo, uh, like a photo bash uh, dot, uh, like in gathering reference images yourself, you might type in a prompt um, it, it'll give you something and you can put that in your mood board. Um, I feel like ethically, at least, you know, if, if a production is requiring that we don't use AI for our concept pieces, we can at least, you know, because we generally will use, you know, copyright images and that sort of thing as part of our mood board as just a, an expression of what we're sort of looking for. Uh, so that is just sort of how I've been using at least, um, with that, uh, other people might have different um, experiences though. Like Tristan, I think you had mentioned. Yeah, well, actually, Reese, I, I, I agree 100%. We, we are always using imagery uh, just generally that doesn't belong to us, but of course it's how you use it. You, you, I mean, we don't actually use it directly, but it becomes stuff that's inspirational for what we're doing. And, and so used that way, I don't see that there's really a problem. It's, if you're really gonna select somebody's sky and then put it in the, you know, then you're getting into trouble. But if you say to somebody, well, we want a sky that's a bit like this, can you head out and do something? Um, sorry. I Thank think you. it was, oh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. oh, Sam, I'm so sorry. I no, keep no, popping no. in right as you're trying to move us along. I think as well, when I'm thinking of that question of like mood boards translating to, um, like actually being used like Reese was making me think of the images that like you showed earlier and so I feel like I feel like a it it's gonna depend on what AI um you know like what what generative image engine like they're using because right now different ones are kind of coming at it from different places um like Shutterstock is partnering with OpenAI and um right now two of the like most controversial ones are like Midjourney and Stable Diffusion because of the sheer scraping of the internet to provide like the data learning and again I think that comes back to like if your thing needs my thing to be relevant and to put out a product that could be put on the market at the same value as my thing like therein lies the issue and it's gonna come down to licensing like it already is an issue like where we're finding images from and yeah like what you know what we're putting on screen and what we're referencing and it is always our like interpretations and I think that like many of the like Twitter artists that I follow are trying to keep that a huge part of the conversation, like the human creativity element. And that when we, you know, are taking something in and then creating something new, like that human element is applying our life's experiences, perspectives, you know, and, and then, and that is how we are interpreting it with AI. It is, it is, it is data 
points that it is being fed, like going back to the sticky note that I showed earlier, like if it's not being fed information, you know, for point G, it can't produce something for point G. And Tristan, like you were saying, like it can do all of these amazing things, but you're like, give me a plan and it, and it doesn't know how to do that. Um, yeah, so that's what I just wanted to add is that it's going to it's going to come down to what engines are used, where do they get the imagery from, how closely is what's being produced for on screen, how close is that to that, you know, prelim imagery. I think also who's making that prelim imagery? Is it still coming from within the art department or is it like a producer that has handed mood boards that they made themselves? Like it's, you know, it's a big conversation. Yes, and maybe to illustrate you know, uh, the discussion, I see in the chat, David Laramie, who says, I perceive, I suppose AI, I perceive it as offering a recipe, whereas it does not know the results or combining the ingredients. So we have this kind of black box where um, uh, we don't know the exactly the process, we know the ingredients. But maybe uh, on this, you know, I, I studied earlier to say like, what is the impact of AI on your creative vision? And maybe um, to go a step further, what is the influence of AI on art and creation? And I know Tristan, when we had this you know, pre-discussion uh, a few days ago, um, you know, AI being so easy to use right now, being widespread um, and becoming part of the pop culture, uh, it can also become a reference. Uh, to creation and influence um, uh, maybe art and the fact that we're getting bombarded with too much information and too many visuals. Uh, does any of you see a potential loss of quality or change or new trends um, as, as a result of, uh, of AI arriving and being widespread? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll start first because my mic's still on, but uh, yeah, there's, I mean, a lot of times what gets generated at the beginning and I thought, oh, this is fun. And now I look at it and I, it's often extremely tasteless. So, you know, it, or whatever taste it is, it's, it's just peculiar at times, but the, uh, like it, it, AI, there's this expression that it hallucinates, right? Because it makes associations, it, it puts together things and then suddenly generates this bizarre thing. And it's one of the worst things is it's, it's lamps all look like these bizarre spider ribs. I'm not quite sure why, like these lamps, maybe it'll get way better. It does really weird things to features. Um, it, um, so it does kind of, the way auto-tune is kind of effective music, I, I feel like to some extent it could potentially damage. The example that I gave when, you, when we were talking the last time was now if you punch in, just Google Monet uh, or you know, uh, Cezanne, you're gonna find more images that are not actually done by Cezanne, but are but done by somebody who's done a, a, a you know, a fairly bad copy of a Cezanne. And then it gets really hard to say, well, I mean, I can tell the differences because I know Cezanne quite well, but I couldn't always tell the differences. I mean, often I would. So it's a strange thing how that's going to transform. Um, the, the other thing with music, everybody, I guess you guys know that there's going to be like Beatles AI, uh, you know, or uh, and this is just a thing coming. People are going to like Beatles AI more than the original Beatles or the Stones or whoever is. I know them kind of pass a year. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> I, no, I know that. Totally. Oh, no, Reese, you go, go ahead. You go. Oh, um, I know that for me, at least, um, I mean, it was, it was kind of interesting. It was kind of fun in the beginning, um, but I felt like um, part of the process of, of anything creative is the process itself. So that sort of, you know, the, the time that it takes to do it, the, the errors that you make, uh, the struggles, the miscommunication that happens, um, all of that sort of leads to, you know, the end result. And um, with uh, Midjourney, at least with the generative art images, you're sort of jumping from idea to finished product. So there's sort of not that process in between. And that process is a big part, at least for me, of where I get satisfaction from, from working, um, doing um, concept design. So, I mean, I, I feel like well, also, it's like, is AI making a better nurse? Probably not. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's not making you a better writer. Um, it certainly helps you be more productive, um, at least for now. Um, maybe when it gets to a point where it's it becomes something that we can sort of bounce ideas off of, um, and it's more of assisting us, you know, reach our creative potential that way. Uh, I feel like perhaps uh, it'll it'll uh, be more of uh, what it was meant to meant to do as a tool, but anyway, that's just my experience with that. 
Thank you. Nicola, do you want to uh, jump in or add something? I feel like I'd just be adding what these fine fellows have already said. Like totally, I totally agree. And I, I think it comes back to that, like, you know, um, yeah, like I'd love, you know, I'd love, I'd love if AI could be a little robot that could help me keep my schedules better instead of, you know, the fear that it could take my job. Like that is, you know, it is, it is a sad place that we're in that instead of being able to be like, ooh, yay, technology, you know, to play with. Um, I've been keeping my eye on the AI updates that like Photoshop has been implementing. Um, and the conversation there is that I believe, I believe Adobe is using their like Firefly stock for all of the like AI generative imagery. But then I feel like when I look at that future and with the fact that like the machine learning is is going to objectively become better and better, I worry like, you know, is that kind of uh, signing, if I'm a stock photographer, do I want to be uploading to a site where I'm going to be paid for something that could eventually take me over? Like, you know, if if there wasn't such an economical boom behind AI right now, like would Shutterstock be on the same timeline for wanting to produce that? I don't know, because, you know, they've said that the compensation will be if you're photography or, or artwork is uploaded and then used that you will be compensated but to time what Tristan was saying about music everyone knows that the Spotify deals like although Spotify is very convenient for us that the Spotify payout for artists is garbage it's garbage it's not a future that musicians are saying yep we love this you guys should do it too like there are already issues with that and with artists being you know like paid their due so that's what I wanted to add. And, and with that as well, too, um, because AI constantly needs to be trained, um, you know, we'll reach a point where AI is training on AI art. So, I mean, it's going to be interesting for sure. That's bizarre to think of, isn't it? Like, I picture the most Alice in Wonderland things when I think of AI art being trained on AI art. <laughs> but one of the things I just want to get to in this conversation is, uh, like, well, you're, you know, a set is a very specific thing. It has to do all these things that are complex and so on. And, and so the, the, that whole process, to, little, the set that I had and the thing that Peter Stratford had actually done, was the set designer on, it took so much to think about how we, it's a three-dimensional object. We're all thinking about it in like, you know, you know, walls that have to come off and all kinds of things. But the, the strange thing is, um, uh, you know, is really why the set? Like, you know, we, we all were worrying about this, about blue screen a long time ago, but what stops people from saying, well, you know, we don't need the set anymore. That's completely obsolete. And so that part does every day cross my mind. And we were worried about it in 2000. We thought like, and then somebody said, you know, actors don't like to act if there's no, nothing behind them. But I don't know in the future, especially if the actors aren't actual actors, if they're just, you know, AI. Yes, and, um, and and I think like correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, but I feel like in this conversation, like it's it's hard at this point to um uh, to decide on a on a cap on how much AI can be used on a project. I think it's it's something that we'll learn and know in um like in months or maybe years of uh, of the impact of uh, of AI and and also the discussion that we're having today and in, in during workshops about what are the considerations that makes AI ethical and, and also philosophical questions about you know creation and um, and the level of human involvement uh, necessary for for creation. Yeah. Good point. Yes. Totally agreed. Totally um, agreed. Is there a topic uh, that uh, you wanted to talk about that uh, we didn't? Touch on. I'm just sure. looking at the time, so we have uh, we have more at least a good ten minutes before getting to the Q and A. So there there was a good question that Alex uh, had. Um, do, is it okay if I jump on that, or do we wait to the for the Q and A for that? No, I think you can. Uh, you can. You okay. can. Yeah. So the future uh, of the profession of concept artists. I mean, it's definitely hard to hard to tell. Uh, I mean, I know when 3D came into the picture for concept artists, it was a big shift as well too. Uh, and it's a lot of artists sort of, if you're not 
uh, utilizing 3D at some point uh, as a concept artist, you are sort of falling behind a little bit behind. Um, now, there are still those amazing concept artists that do get a lot of work and they're not utilizing it. I think that'll sort of be the same same thing. Although my, my biggest concern, again, is, is, again, increased productivity. If it takes me three um, days to do like an environment piece, um, you know, right from concept to, to completion. And if uh, if AI helps me do that in like say one day, then I'm going to be expected to generate even more concept. Then uh, it's so it's it's not benefiting me directly. It's certainly helping me be more productive. But you know that expectation is then just going to you know uh, be something that I have to bear as well. Uh, as for the future of, of, I feel like it really, as concept artists, we we have to find what makes us unique as concept artists. And that's going to be very difficult for junior concept artists coming into the industry to be able to sort of stand out and, um, you know, uh, and, you know, uh, make it something that, that they can really excel at to get to a point where they are now being hired as, you know, Reese York or as, you know, their name, as opposed to just, hey, we need a junior concept artist type thing. So, um, but I, I do feel that's that's uh, the sort of thing. I, I tend, my own approach, um, when the industry is zigging, I tend to zag. So uh, I'm sort of going back to more painterly sort of style um, uh, and that sort of thing. I'm, I'm finding different ways to utilize this technology to help me um, and not, not be afraid of it, uh, but also sort of to push it in a direction that um, sort of speaks to my own voice as well. So I hope that helps. Yes, and maybe on, on, on that topic and maybe um, uh, more in general, uh, you know, for you, Reese, and, uh, and also Nicola, Tristan, you can jump in. So like we don't know yet, but AI is supposed to make the world to, to make you more productive. But how to what extent does it like add new adds new layers of work? Meaning that you know you can create more images, so you you create like a volume of content or images that is just bigger and larger than what you were like dealing with before. So it, do you spend more time working, or is that really, um, or is that does it, is that does that it augments your work, or it, like it it facilitates? So to what extent are you working less, working more? Well, in my case, I don't find that. Like I said at the beginning, I don't find it's made the job easier. If anything, there's much more data to, to try to churn through. Uh, we try to do, uh, you know, we, you know, people use Dropbox or sometimes I like to use Miro a lot and everybody starts to put their images up. And before you know it, you've got so much stuff there. Um, it, it becomes really difficult or from an organizational perspective. Um, uh, so, so, yeah, I mean, it would be great. I mean, the whole idea was we're supposed to only go to work for three three days, you know, two days in a week, you know, and, <laughs> and we got, but the reality is it's true. We're way better. I mean, I think everybody, you'd all agree, right? I mean, it's easy to do stuff that was very, very difficult before. We're much better than, you know, but we're just more productive and we're just, um, we're still running, but just doing way more. So that's the problem. I would love to build on that too, because I completely agree. And I, you know, I think, yeah, like Reese, when you're saying, um, you know, it, it increases like the amount that you can produce, but you're not necessarily sure that this is actually going to shorten, you know, your workload. Like, um, you know, I, I think that some of the more positive conversations like around the AI tend to focus or try and focus on, yeah, like where could it actually be like, cutting down time on on tasks to allow for you know more time spent on the creativity and like the rewarding stuff and I think like when I look at it I'm not really afraid that like art department people are going to be like screwing over other art department people with this like my you know fears when I look at it truly do come from like the the non art people, like you know, we 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 already say with clearances so that like sometimes it feels like the clearance lawyers are designing the shows because they're, you know, shooting things down, left, right, and center, and and again, like wanting to keep this as like a collaborative process where like these roles are individually designed as such to allow for like that teamwork to come together and people to be implementing their specialties you know it's not good for us if our 
days are shortened because less of us are getting jobs. It's great for us if our days are all collectively being shortened because, you know, there are ways that, you know, AI is able to be implemented that can actually help with that. And from what I've seen thus far, I agree with Reese, I haven't been seeing things that are for like the artists using it necessarily benefiting us aside from when it's talking about like deadlines and how much can you produce in this amount of time and then I know I look at it like well you know that leads to a, a, an even bigger issue I mean this is one of the big things that the writers are striking on right now that the WGA is striking on is the the profit margin of you know CEOs of big companies and that that is not trickling down to them and the fears that like those people already making those profits are the ones that are going to abuse this technology and take it away from being you know how can we use this to expand our creative experience and and that's going to depend on how you're brought up like I think it's really important for us to keep mentioning trainees and like art school graduates and people that are just starting into the field like I feel like we perhaps have an, some advantages well I mean it kind of depends because it depends on like how adaptable you are and like so and so forth and you know it just continues to paint the picture that it is an expansive conversation that requires I think a lot of understanding from different viewpoints and to get a whole picture. And I think it's naive to treat it otherwise. Great. Um, so if you don't have first a comment, maybe we'll move to some of um, the questions that we have uh, here in the Q&A chat. And I see that there are more questions potentially in the webinar chat. So uh, if there are any questions there, I invite everyone to, uh, to ask questions in the Q&A box. Um, so to answer your question, Jose Luis, um, my background is AI generated. It's not my, my library or a photo of my library. So um, yes. Um, and I see a question about uh, clearance uh, and potentially copyright from Dylan Mac uh, Manami. Um, and the question is, what are the implications for using AI to generate clear artwork for sets. Are these images actually royalty free or is there a legal gray area as the imagery is largely derivative? Yes, derivative, sorry. My current understanding of clearances is no, you would not be able to do, you would not be able to put up say an AI generated painting like onto a set because I do not believe that the licenses exist that would be able to apply to the majority of film productions that we experience in Toronto. Like a license was pointed out at one point, I can't remember if it was for Mid Journey or Stable Diffusion, but the marker that was given was like for a project under a million, which is like, you know, especially for the TV shows and stuff coming through Toronto. Um, so no, unless you are able to point again like it's gonna have to be all of this backtracing and if you're using mid journey or stable diffusion there is no effing way you're gonna be able to get it on screen i feel like you're gonna have a really lax clearance lawyer who's maybe gonna get in trouble later because they it is it is on the record from the founders of these like companies and technology that they have just openly scraped the internet that they did not take clearance licenses and copyright licenses into consideration because it would be too much because there's too many images that they've trained it on and again like this is not tech that you can like put you can put the toothpaste back into the tube and so we're gonna have to adapt to what is like actually happening and I feel like that's where I feel like a lot of strength with this like art conversation and what people have been saying on the Facebook is that I feel we and like, you know, with everything going on with the writer's strike, we are reacting in a very real way, you know, to wanting, you know, accepting the fact that it's such a fast moving technology and that we have to, we do have to adapt, but, you know, we, we can adapt without literally selling ourselves short, you know, like that shouldn't have to be the answer that, 
with regards to that too, I mean, a lot of it also depends, you know, the studios creating these these programs, if they are used something and say it is royalty free or whatever, um, if it's generated by AI currently, according to US law, it cannot be copyright. So that also poses another issue, another layer of issues. Um, I think as well too, correct me if I'm wrong, I think current understanding is as well that um, you can copy, if, if an artist is involved in the image, you can copyright the part that the artist is involved, but the part that is AI generated is not uh, copyright. So you then you get an image that's partly copyright, it's very strange area for sure. And again, this technology is moving a lot faster than uh, the lawmakers and, and that sort of thing can keep up with. So, it's, there, uh, sorry to interrupt, but there, there are two pieces to that too. One is that, you know, so let's say it's grabbing a whole bunch of data off the internet and so on. We think that the image is composed of, you know, billions and billions of parts, but in reality, 70 or 80% of it might be like one thing, one artist thing, that's one piece. And the other thing is there's no control over the idea of the brand. So, you know, like it's actually stealing, you know, if you if you can manage to copy, uh, I don't know, um, uh, somebody's voice uh, to that extent, you're really copying the that person's brand. Uh, yeah, exactly. Somebody's asked about the Greg Rutkowski. So it's exactly, or uh, that's unique, but that's exactly the point. It's, it's one thing to say, you know, you know, one some images are going to be like eighty or ninety percent somebody's work, and then and then you and then the question is, you're taking somebody's brand, so it's really complex. Uh, thank you. So maybe moving to another question, I, I saw some questions related to policy. So uh, as we discussed, we won't be able to really um, um, address you know the policy questions tonight. Um, one question was about what can the guild do to ensure that producers do not use students or interns. We know how to use the AI tools to replace more expensive um, VFX or GFX artists. Um, so that definitely, uh, you know, like a overall industry question, the same way that, for example, performers, voice artists, uh, you know, also find themselves in danger. Um, and um, another question that we have in the chat, um, how AI is going to be used and issues in set design and working construction drawings. That's, that's a specific question. So I don't know if you would like to answer this one specifically. Yeah, I guess I'm, I guess I'm the most art directory <laughs> group. Uh, yeah, it would be, I mean, I can't see that happening for a while because it is technical drawings. It's just replacing the entire set that I'm kind of concerned about. But once we get into the details of how you put a set together, it's, you know, it's a very specific talent uh, it's a whole bunch of people working together and thinking about it and walking through it and changing it and so on so that that sort of um uh and actually uh, reese was saying this about moving sort of zig zig zigging and zagging but there, there's this wonderful uh fact of the of, of trying to bring the analog world back all the time and everybody seems kind of intent on it we get you know, I look at these things, they're all two, you know, on a two dimensional surface or whatever. And, I, and suddenly I just want to see like big chunks of paint on something and feel like, oh yeah, that's a real, you know, that was a bit of a rant. Mm -hmm. No, I totally uh, agree. And I think it links into what you were saying earlier about, you know, like one potentially like positive aspect that we could look at is creating more niche roles. Like when you were talking about like hand letterers and stuff, like, you know, I, I, I do think, um, I think a lot of people are, are feeling that like, the, you know, even with, I can't remember what the exact name of the technology is, but it's the LED panels that Mandalorian like made so popular. And Virtual then production. I, yes. And I remember even with that, after that, you saw like, you know, a boom of productions, like wanting to use it. Like, I think, I think it's, the kind of trend of the thing like ooh, new exciting you know gadget how can we use it and then people are either going to use it really well or they're not going to use it you know that that well at all and I do think that it long term you know there are going to be standouts but it does sadden me to think of you know a, a kind of flooding of yeah like subpar junky content when you were talking about like trying to search things all i could think of is how often 
I'm trying to search things. And then the stuff that comes up is just like websites selling posters of the image. And it's like, no, I don't need a poster of the image. I'm trying to do visual research. Like already, you know, it's it's pointing you towards like stores that are selling things instead of just like visual research on the internet. Like, I think that those are important trends to look at. And I think that when it comes to AI and this technology, like we're seeing micro trends happen, the like really explosive micro trends, like the lens app that came out and that whole thing. And that was just like one month last year, let alone what's happened to now. So if I can put on my software engineering hat for, for a moment. Do it. And, and play devil's advocate. No, I can, do it. I love I it. I can totally see that. So AI is actually doing a really good job right now in um in actually reproducing 3D. So basically, um, and it's coming. It's certainly coming. Um whether we might possibly have something I can see, it's like, okay, so we have this this budget, we want this location, like, uh, and that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, adjusting the set based on that, uh, generate the CAD drawings. I can see that happening for sure in the, in the future. Um, although we might just even skip over that at that point um, and sort of, and just sort of be generating, you know, virtual sets, uh, virtual actors, virtual scripts, <laughs> everything's virtual. Um, yeah, so it'll definitely, definitely be interesting. So there is, there is a lot of, a lot of um, stuff, but I mean, again, it's, it's just sort of, we don't know where this stuff is is happening and where it's taking. Um, there are areas, there are particular models. There might be a new model that um, comes out six months from now that sort of changes everything um, and turns everything on its head. So again, uh, it's best to keep informed and uh, to, to keep ahead of it a little bit. And the hope is uh, there is a lot of pushback as well for you know human generated things for sure. My my background is human generated, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, we we shall see what the the future holds there. Yeah, I I'm so glad that people here have been mentioning. Um, you mentioned like the copyright uh, statement that was given. Yeah, there are big like like legal cases and and conversations happening that are are really crucial to keep an eye on like interviews with like the founders or I think like Sam Altman was just like summit to Congress recently like there are definitely there are big yeah there are big developments and it's I think it's so crucial to stay updated even though it feels like overwhelming because it's so much to like update like I have like a page of notes in front of me and even just one of my notes is just like separating like you know the different like engines because yeah like it just it all gets called AI but it, it they're you know they're it's different things and I think that, that doesn't necessarily help the conversation because it, it it does take it down to like I know that like writers you know for chat GPT are feeling similarly that like if your chat bot is writing better stories because it's scraping our stories, then again, you know, we do live in a system where we like are, are you know, need to make money. And, it, and, and yeah, it becomes the question of if your thing is on the market at the same price as my thing, but it's used my thing to do it. Where, where do we go from there? And it feels like a slippery slope to cutting artists out of the picture. And I'm so, I I am hopeful by like the strong reactions that people are having and by like how many people are having this conversation, how wide ranging it is. You know, like I was seeing testimony from like writers, musicians, composers, like like art, like art artists, graphic designers, all, all kinds, and, you know, for I think as long as copyright has been a thing and will be a thing, it's gonna be a, an evolving, conversation I think the AI just kind of like speeds that up threefold and more which can be terrifying <laughs> I just wanted to jump in for a quick sec uh, for a second but I uh, I asked uh, Midjourney to generate an image uh, with a prompt could you create a work of art that ex that expresses why AI art is superior to human art and of course rather than some you know, I would have hoped it would have said well I can't it didn't it made this image I looked at the image and it was really creepy. All I could think was, do I not understand what it understands at this point? Like you said, there's a big monster over us. And I was like, okay, it went on. 
Mm -hmm. I love that. <laughs> So we are, I, I can see we're having like a number of interesting questions. So, so one question, like more like a clarification was uh, uh, coming from, um, yes, David Laramie. And uh, that was about the background and um, can you use like AI, um, AI generated images in the background? And what about, you know, the virtual production volumes this weekend in Vancouver, the DGC hosted actually, actually workshop on, uh, on VR production. And so I, I, I would assume it's, it's the same, right? Like uh, what, what, whatever you, you put on screen of your production volume, there is this question whether or not uh, there is a copyright question that remains. And, and there was an additional question about Japan. And, and I think it's without getting into the policy question, one thing we can say is that between the US Supreme Court's decision, decision copyrights between what's happening in Japan where they decided that copyright doesn't apply to AI training, knowing that in Canada, we are in a gray zone right now. I think, you know, it's fair to say that uh, we need to wait and see what, what is decided in the coming months and, uh, and maybe years, but um, uh, so far it's, it's a bit unclear. And that policy will also evolve as it evolves in those different regions, the same way that it does now where, uh, you know, like depending on where the show is like going to be broadcast, there might be different laws that like you have to take into place or I know like the... Um, what's like the classic one, like the, when you can like use an artist's work and like who holds the copyright, but it's often not as simple as just the rule of like, you know, however many years after they died, because maybe the family kept the copyright, like it'll keep evolving and it'll keep depending on what these, you know, what our different regions are putting into place and into law. Um, yeah. Um, there was an interesting question from David Dutch about uh, people learning prompts, AI prompts, uh, and, and what would happen when AI and quantum uh, computing combine. So may, maybe that's, that could be the topic for um, DGC workshop, but how do you feel about uh, AI prompts? And what is your experience maybe with, um, uh, with prompting mid-journey or other tools? And, and do you find like it's, it's vital to actually uh, be knowledgeable on how to write a prompt correctly? It's true, isn't it? The, the, there, someone was saying that the poets are going to be the new um, new people to bring in the AI revolution so they, with a, um, these generated prompts. Um, I, I find generally, I mean, yeah, it, it's, it's good to sort of learn how these prompt systems work, but these prompt systems are also evolving as well too. So uh, which uh, what might have worked well with Midjourney version three is a little bit different with uh, the latest Midjourney as well. So that's something to keep in mind uh, as well. I, I think the DGC does have some courses on on ChatGPT as well as Midjourney, um, which I think is what sort of started this this entire discussion. Um, but uh, yeah, for sure. I think it, it will evolve. I, I feel like to sort of touch a little bit on what I think the end result is, is, you know, we, we might get to a point where, you know, it's just basically we're creating custom or computers are creating custom content for individuals, basically, so. And, and I also see a question uh, whether or not um, this uh, conversation is being recorded. Yes, uh, it's going to be on the DGC National uh, and YouTube page. So um, like other videos, uh, you're going to be able very soon to find, uh, find the recording. Um, uh, there was another question about, and, and we, we, we talked about this a bit earlier, it's when we see uh, AI generating millions of images, um, is there a risk to see you know, the, the value of work or the value of uh, artists, you know, creative work to be devalued uh, or by you know, non-artists? Uh, would consider, you know, a piece of what, what, what they consider a piece of art is worse, uh, how much, you know, artists should be paid or, or should charge for their work. I think it's, it's a big question, but it's, maybe the question is more about than that what we discussed earlier, that uh, what is the value of an image today or what is the meaning of an image also creatively? I think it's maybe a creative question. First. Sure. I, I've seen it and experienced it. Um, I know that uh, is it Spotify deleted over 10,000 AI generated songs. I think Amazon is also getting flooded with AI generated uh, books. Um, 
And and yeah, I mean that was initially that's sort of when when the anxiety sort of sets in. Um, you know, it's it's like it it artists, writers, creative industries in general, it feels like you're not valued enough to begin with. And I, I hate the term democratizing. Um, like the AI, AI democratizes uh, the art industry, but it doesn't. I mean, anyone from whether you're poor or rich, you know, can pick up a pencil and learn how to draw. You know, it, I feel like art was already democratized. It's just a matter of of how much time you put into it uh, to learn to learn the art, and to all of a sudden be able to generate something like you've been training for ten years, um, and in painting and composition and and uh, color theory and all that sort of thing, uh, it does really sort of feel like it's devaluing um, the amount of training and and um, and that that it takes to become an artist. Same thing with like writing as well too with the ChatGPT. Although, I ChatGPT is a whole nother <laughs> topic. I, I find it's it's pretty pretty awful right now. But anyway, so that's just my experience. What about uh, Tristan or Nicole? Nicole. Um. Yeah, Tristan, why don't you go ahead? Yeah. So so I, I completely agree with you. Um, I think uh, it's possible, though, that that niche objects or things that are analog will suddenly well will, will develop a new um, uh, following. You know, the, the sort of the way, uh, the way people are still into LPs. You know, like uh, so. I think people there, there'll always be that reaction of well, this is made by humans and that makes it good, and that stuff's made by a machine, and so it's not as good. Like I think that I think there is a lot of that, and um, you know, films don't all have to be, you know, have to have those you know, uh, many mooned or many sunned backgrounds. They can they can just take place in somebody's apartment and they'd be totally wonderful. And, Full of all kinds of emotions in the end we're, we're really into our emotions more than the images right like when you really think about it what really gets us going is is our feelings and this this stuff these machines don't understand feelings and that's the one advantage they may one day in which case you know, you know, but uh that's our advantage and, you know so and i think like again like to tie that into like you know, like, like work day and like work hours in the day and like the, the, the creativity side of it, like, uh, it, 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 yeah, like it, it, it just calls to question, you know, sorry, I'm trying to gather my thoughts. I, things that I'm thinking of are issues that we already struggle with in the in you know in the industry period like not even just in our department but you know streaming shows are like more and more shows are coming out and we're not like we're in, we're already having issues present with like deadlines of of studios you know wanting to make like the best looking show and like episodes now kind of feeling like you're prepping a mini movie instead of what like a tv show episode like maybe used to feel like and so I think like re something you've you saying earlier of like yeah I can make more but does it m mean that my workload has gone down like that's the kind of stuff that I think of and then I think it's all like tied back to is yeah like who who is going to be using this for for what and and why because I think that human creativity will yeah like always reign supreme like why do we make films in the first place exactly like what Tristan was saying because we're trying to convey a uh, perspective our feelings our stories um you know and we already struggle with profit margins you know maybe maybe determining things a, a lot more than they should and wanting to be able to like focus on the artistry of it and like the story that we're trying to tell um and and yeah like I I I would love for the conversation to be able to more so be you know like how how can we do that and I think it's I, 
sad but very real that we are looking at like policy and and how it will affect jobs and how it could be could be implemented and I think like the longevity of it is also going to be linked into like that like what you were saying Tristan of like yeah just a bunch of guck just gets you know dumped onto the market and people aren't watching that if things are driven by the market then you know it's going to cancel itself out but it doesn't mean that there's not going to be having to deal with all that guck in the meantime <laughs> like even if we you know stay the long stay and we're like no we're artists and we're going to persevere and we're going to keep doing it because we know like what we want to create in our hearts that can be a very different reality than you know securing paychecks and securing futures and what are the new artists coming onto the scene you know looking at like again to bring back the writer's strike um you know, a big part of what they're talking about is that it's kind of erasing, you know, training future showrunners because they're being given smaller budgets. And if they can only hire like one person, they're going to hire, you know, a super well experienced writer. But then where does that leave our trainees? Like, again, it's it's a conversation, I think, to be looked at from so many angles and taking every role into consideration from trainee all the way up to production designer. I just wanted to add, add one thing that's kind of, okay, this is like, I'm, this is me being a philosopher. So I'm sort of taking off into a weird place, but. My favorite um, part of this combo, yeah. please go yeah. on. Um, but you know, uh, the idea of ownership is very weird, right? Like, I mean, it's it's part of, you know, if, if you've been to school and you sort of studied Marx and so on, I, I mean, I'm not gonna promote Marx for you guys, but the idea that we own stuff is just really weird. Like, it, you know, so, we're supposed to all be really creative and enjoy the human enjoy human existence and not struggle over issues of ownership and everything and but it would just be really great if it was the corporations who understood that too not just you know a bunch a bunch of artists who feel like uh you know we don't own our language we don't own you know copywriting our paintings all that feeling of, you know but anyway that's a crazy hippie idea so I, i'll just stop now no i love it <laughs> So, so maybe to continue on that topic, um, you know, Tristan, I see a few questions related to ownership, IP, authenticity. So maybe the first one from um, Jose Luis Gutierrez. Speaking of copyright and clearances, would AI become a boom for entertainment lawyers to deal with sparkly copyright images? I think, as we said, we don't really know. Um, are, are we able to track the source of copyright? I think it's, it's a it's kind of difficult question. And maybe will entertainment lawyers be replaced by ChatGPT? Um, well, I, I don't think we have the answer, right? Um, to, to that to that point, though, um, we are now seeing actually AI being used to track AI, so to verify AI. Hmm. So that is going to be a whole other arms race as well for, for that sort of thing. And, and, and maybe about this uh, race, I think I read about ChatGPT being able to track whether or not some text is AI generated. So what you're saying is that the same exists, would exist for... Um, for images. As well. Images, yeah. Okay. That's really amazing. But then that makes me think, like, is that just a kind of software that companies are going to start having to implement as standard? Like, if they are anti-AI, anti even if there's, like, the software that exists for being able to determine that it's AI, the person using that stof software still needs to know, look for it. So there is now software that will actually take your AI generated chat GPT and change it enough to make it untrackable. So again, oh it's, it's an arms race. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. And I feel like that's just going to continue. Like, that's the way it's going to be. It's going to be like this, this, you know, like this reactive thing. Uh, but yeah. I mean, so, yes, yeah, but, you know, so that'll be the due diligence, right? Well, we pay this company uh, and, the, you know, they have this program. It checked, so we're paying it. You know, so, I mean, I guess the word of that. Oh. <laughs> Um, on, on the same topic, uh, Peter Stratford uh, is asking, are we, aren't we forfeiting creativity with AI? What about the ethics of authenticity? Isn't AI allowing non-creative or talented users the illusion of doing good work, a Pandora's box or an enabler uh, to with the artists? I, uh, sorry, I'll just jump in here. I, I know for me personally, at least, I definitely feel this way. It's, it, it, it is give you um, an unauthentic feeling of satisfaction. I know mm -hmm. I definitely felt that way um, mm -hmm. when I was generating, oh, hey, you know, 
generate something in the style of a Yoji Shinkawa, um, you know, which uh, is fantastic. I'm like, oh, hey, you know, even though I spent, you know, another four hours or so making it my own, the the result was hollow and sort of empty. Um, same thing, even if I, I you know, use ChatGPT to sort of generate a prompt or generate, um, help me generate a log line or an outline and that sort of thing. It still feels like, you know, uh, I sort of needed help from AI and and uh, it definitely, definitely was not almost like a guilt feeling for sure. And that's perhaps because the technology is very new, um, but uh, as well, yeah, it, it certainly does allow you know, some non, non-creative users or people who haven't put the time into learning art and that sort of thing to generate something that looks good. Um. Yes, and, and I think we have another great question from Hamish Buchanan on the, on the same topic again, um, that AI seems to generate what would be the predictable thing here based on the world average input. So that is like the uh, output, the result is that is that an average of, of, of something or an average of what it has been trained to do or to, or to produce. And, and then uh, Hamish says, producers love predictability. The hard part as ever is fighting for the original elements. So how do we stay original and, um, and can we moving forward? Or the, where, where does it, we should put buyers or yeah, oh, that's so a really I, important question. Oh, go ahead, Tristan. Go ahead. Yeah, Hamish's question was actually uh, sort of goes back to uh, something again in philosophy, this sort of difference between rationalism and empiricism, uh, or uh, um, uh, the, the 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 sort of discussions that occurred in linguistics in the in the nineteen fifties, sixties, seventies. Noam Chomsky was one of the guys who was on the generative grammar side. The idea is that like the there's a sort of innate quality that humans individually carry that they all have that they express themselves. And so, if if what the, if the image that you're you're getting is like just massively uh, non-discerning thing based on well, that's not it. If you punch in, tell me what a hero is. Uh, it it's like bizarre. Actually, it's really bizarre. If you punch in justice it's like this weird thing that comes out. So, and it's because it doesn't do what we do. It doesn't carry the sort of moral questions that Reese over plagiarism. Like we have this moral notion of play, it doesn't have that. It just goes through and goes, well, these, this is the way I, you know, this is the data that I've, I've the input that I've accumulated. And the output is, so, so this is an old story. It goes back to the fifties at least. Well, actually it goes back to early with questions and philosophies. Completely agreed, completely agreed. And I feel like that question is at, like, is truly at the heart of this. I think it's why this conversation got started in the first place. And, you know, even if it doesn't get answered today in this panel, I think it's an important ongoing conversation to be having about just that. And I think, you know, it's, yeah, like where we need to band together you know like as like guilds and unions within the film industry and I think the way that we continue to you know stand for our own like authentic human creativity like like is through that like the, you know the putting the policy in place is not you know whatever that ends up being is not to stifle the technology for the sake of stifling the technology I think it's more so to give time to to artists to to under you know and everyone being affected by this to understand how their futures um are are going to change Tristan, you started off with like your intro where you're talking about yeah like uh we've seen this at different points where you're talking about like backgrounds used to be like scenic and now they're from the art department and you know we made that transition but it doesn't mean that the rules and nuance aren't still there for like separating those departments. And again, like, you know, that's where the strength of unions comes in for ensuring that we can adapt with, you know, with what's being thrown at us. Like I saw a great quote um, that said, a union gives workers the same ability to adapt to changing industries that the companies already have. And I really felt 
that for sure. Um, Cause yeah, I don't think, I think, yeah, my fears come from that, that side of it. It's more so, I feel like as artists, we'll figure it out and, you know, like the same way that we adapt every time Photoshop does give some insane new tool. And then now the thing that you've been doing the same way for like 20 years can be done in like a minute and it's mind boggling. Like, I think we will figure it out, but I do think it's, yeah, it's just important for us to keep having these conversations and to figure out like what policy we do all want to try and like push to be in place to, to allow for close to like best case timeline instead of worst case timeline of whatever that may be. I can see we're getting close to, um, um, you know, the end of, uh, of uh, this uh, session. So may maybe, you know, in closing, um, would you have like a last word of, uh, or something that uh, you would uh, suggest for next AI conversation? Yeah, so I'll just suggest uh, something to do with use. Like we could, you know, I mean, everybody's thinking about this too. Like, how do we, you know, we can't just run away from it being there. So how do we, how do we incorporate it into our lives? Maybe there, there needs to be uh, education related stuff. I totally agree. And like, again, kind of bringing up like why this was brought on in the first place was was that sort of ethical position of, you know, is it okay? And again, like, I'm not saying we have to answer it in this session, forgive me, Sam, but like, is it okay, you know, for our guild to be offering training? Again, like, I feel like it depends on where you're coming from, but I do think that the really legitimate comments were like, what is the ethics of promoting something like that when we're already in, like a writer's strike and facing a really slow summer and the impacts of that. And just that, you know, before something like that was being offered, it would be great to understand the guild's st stance on it, to be able to have the conversations about, you know, what we feel should be brought to the table. The same way as when we do like our, you know, contract negotiations and such, where we're kind of weighing out, you know, what's being brought forth. And, and, you know, not everyone is going to look at it from a nuanced perspective. There are going to be people who are like, it's cool. Why are you worrying? <laughs> or like, it's inevitable. Get on board. <laughs> and it is inevitable. It is inevitable. But I don't think it means that, you know, we have to go without voicing like our thoughts so I'm really appreciative that we can like have this panel and start to have this conversation um I think yeah for future ones like for me it would just yeah it would just be things like I totally agree Tristan like usage I think like what the writers are going for in their terminology like I think terminology is gonna be important so I think I feel that a policy discussion would be inevitable, but that's just my personal thoughts. Yeah, I, I echo that as well too. I think the the next steps have to be, you know, and and probably it's a little bit about timing as well. Is that um, you know we have to sort of figure out as an art department, you know, how is this going to affect, you know trainees how is this going to affect seconds how is this like can we we have a tier a sci-fi show with no concept artists you know or is there going to be a, a minimum that sort of thing so things like that um you know can can ai generated whatever supplant um you know a, a live human that sort of thing or does it have to be used in conjunction with one so Definitely, I think that sort of talk needs to happen at some point. So I'd love to see that happen soonish. I think that helping to define it like helps it to be able to be used in the more helpful. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. trying to define what it can't do will help it to, you know, be a tool more so for idea generation perhaps it's so funny because like when I think of that I just think like it would be so much faster for me to thumbnail than for me to sit down and try and prompt but that's because I was brought up that way what if a new art student 
is a master at prompts and for them it's just easier like if you know I would love for that person to be able to do it that way if it is genuinely easier for them but I just don't feel like we're at the point where we can only talk about it from that angle because the fear is that that person will supplant one of us whoever used that word that was a great word <laughs> Well, thank you so much for this fantastic uh, discussion. Uh, we can see there are so many angles to, um, to the A question tonight. Uh, I'm sure we could continue and go on for much more time, and we will uh, at a later date. Um, so, uh, Marion. Yes, thanks so much, you guys. That was a really great conversation, and thanks for all your expertise and input and for the questions from the, uh, the, the attendees. That there were some fantastic questions. and. Hopefully most of them were kind of answered. I mean, it, it, it's obviously, again, a, a bit of an open-ended conversation. And and I, from, from my point of view, if it's just prompted some reflection and consideration about it so that in, indeed there is another conversation or more conversations along, along the ideas that were suggested, that that is a real win for tonight. So I hope this was useful to you. And um, um, Thank, thanks again for to Sam, Tristan, Reese, uh, and Nicola for your for giving your time to this and for the preparation talks we had. And thanks again to everyone who attended tonight. We had a good crowd who mostly hung in there for, for the duration, which was fantastic. And um, and anyway, to, uh, th this will be recorded. The, the the link to the DGC YouTube channel has been in the chat a few times, and. Uh, look for it in a few days. I don't know how long it'll take Julian to to just get this process, but it should be up there probably by you know, midweek or by Friday at, um, at the latest, I would think. So if you want to rewatch it um, or pass it on to your friends, please do. And hopefully we'll have another conversation along these lines soon based based on what everyone was, was commenting on tonight. So thanks so much for your generous time and uh, take Thank care. You. Thank and you for organizing. Oh, and thanks to Julian for sure and the DGC National uh, as well for helping us uh, facilitate this this event tonight. Okay, thanks. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.